Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, and I'm the training specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Asking Inclusive Demographic Questions, How to Do It and Why It Matters, with our presenters, Terry Clark, Catherine Preston Wager, Emily Sopizio, and Elizabeth Petruri, and I'll be introducing our presenters in just a moment. Next slide. Before we get started, just a little bit of information sharing. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. The APS TARC works with states and territories to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of, <clears throat> excuse me, use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can, so please reach out to us. We'll have contact information at the end of the webinar. Next slide. You may not know, but the APS TARC um, presents monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues con concerning APS programs today. The calls, as you will see, are held on the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you belong to. Registration information is sent out via the APS TARC listserv, and if you are not part of that listserv, please email us, and we will make sure that you get that information. Next slide. Now on to some housekeeping. Um, handouts are available in the handout section of your webinar control panel, and you can download them at any time. Please use your computer speakers to control the volume of your audio, and if you experience problems with broadband or audio, um, please go ahead and log out and log back in. Um, and if you continue to, this webinar is being recorded, so you're not going to miss anything. Next slide. We're planning on having time at the end of the presentations for Q&A. You can go ahead and um, send us any questions and comments during the presentation using the questions box in your uh, webinar control panel. And as I said, this webinar is being recorded. We'll let everybody know when it is on the APS TARC website and all attendees will receive an automatically generated email in about 24 hours with a link to download a certificate of attendance. And last but not least, as you are prompted after the webinar, please go ahead and complete our brief um, webinar eval survey. We'd love to hear from you. All right, let's have the next slide. So before we get started, we're gonna, we wanna learn a little bit about you. Um, so we're gonna have a poll which of the following categories do you identify with the most? Is that APS professional, other social services professional, medical professional, legal, or other? And if you are other, um, you can go ahead and let us know what that other may be in the questions box. I was curious about that. All right. How's it going, Andy? Are we getting there? We are getting there. We have about 67% of people voted. That keeps going Great. up. Great. Excellent. Maybe a couple more seconds. Sounds good. And we'll close it out in about five seconds. All right. So I will close those results and share those on the screen. Perfect. Thank you. Well, welcome, Adult Perfect. Protective Services Professionals is the majority, but then I want to say welcome to all of our other folks as well. Got some legal, got some other folks and some others. Um, great. Yeah, go ahead and send in your what your others are. Looks like we have a couple researchers and some ombudsmen. Welcome everyone. So next slide. So just to get the dialogue rolling um, before we introduce our presenters, I want you to go ahead and use your questions box and the webinar control panel to think about these two questions. 
what challenges are you having asking inclusive demographic questions? So questions around race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, potentially income. Um, this could be an intake, it could be an assessment, it could be an in interviews. Um, and if you are not doing direct service uh, with clients or participants, and you are more management and supervision, what are you hearing from your staff around this? So you go ahead and think about that, and um, please feel free to send us any of your feedback or thoughts in the questions um, panel, and we're gonna introduce our presenters and get started. So next slide. So it is with great, great um, enthusiasm that I, I, I introduce our presenters today. We're very lucky to have all of them. Uh, Terry Clark is among her many roles, a SAGE certified trainer with SAGE and the National Resource Center on LGBTQ plus aging. Um, Catherine Preston Wager is Curriculum Development Specialist with the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations, APSWI. Emily Sopizio is Training Program Coordinator with APSWI, and Elizabeth Petruri is Project Officer with the Office of Elder Justice and APS with ACL. Um, you'll hear from Kat and Emily first, and then Terry, and then Elizabeth, and then we'll wrap back around to Q&A with me. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Kat and Emily. Hi, hi y'all. Hello, hi Krista. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Sulpizio. My pronouns are she, her, and I am joined by my colleague, Kat. Hi everyone, I'm Kat Preston Wager. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm super excited to be here with you today. All right, and next slide. All right, so as Krista mentioned, Kat and I are members of the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Team at the Academy for Professional Excellence. So a little bit about us. Um, the Academy is a project of the San Diego State School of Social Work, um, serving over 20,000 health and human service professionals annually. The Academy's mission is to provide exceptional workforce development and learning experiences for the transformation of individuals, organizations, and communities. And Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations, or APSWI, is a training program of the Academy, and we provide innovative workforce development to APS professionals and their partners. All right, next slide. Okay, so let's start by exploring why asking demographic questions are necessary for appropriate service planning. So demographic data, which is information about one's race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera, this data can be used for many reasons. So let's go through some of those. So the first one is to identify resources for service planning. So when demographic questions are asked, it helps APS professionals better understand how the individual identifies, which in turn helps professionals to perform their assessment and identify any resources that may be available to that individual. Another important piece of collecting this demographic data is in order to accurately portray who exactly APS serves. So if we're not asking these questions, and in turn, if we don't then have the accurate demographic data, we don't have a true understanding of who APS serves. And this directly connects to why demographic data is important um, because it allows us to advocate for program funding and support. So we'll talk a bit more about how this collected data is used later in this discussion together. But one important benefit of accurate demographic data is it helps to identify the need for resources and to determine if maybe there's communities or populations that might be underserved or where additional, additional services or supports may be needed. And this data can also be used to support research into the treatment and prevention of older adult and dependent adult abuse. So we might be feeling like these questions are personal. And so what we really wanna share here today is it's important to approach these questions with the goal to strengthen relationships and modify services based on the information collected. 
So when we hold the desire to strengthen relationships at the heart of why we ask these questions, it really allows us the opportunity to get to know the individual while sharing our respect for the person and our desire to promote inclusion. And another important piece of this is that asking inclusive questions directly aligns with person-centered practice. And this helps to ensure that all individuals who APS serves receive the best support available to them. So to be person-centered means to treat individuals with dignity and respect, to build on their strengths, to help um, connect them to their community and develop relationships, and really to take time to know and understand individuals and the things that make them who they are. It really involves a deep respect for individuals and for their equality. And if we offer, operate off of our own assumptions or maybe our uncomfortability at the moment in asking those questions, there really is a high potential for inadequate or inappropriate referrals to be made as a result. So Kat's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. Thank you, Emily. So I do really want to acknowledge that if we don't incorporate sexual orientation and gender identity questions into our assessments, care plans, et cetera, it will impact the relationship and interaction we have with the person in front of us, as well as interventions, service planning, including referrals. When I talk about the relationship or interaction and how it impacts when we don't ask these questions, Think of your own identities, lesbian, questioning, male, non-binary, whatever it be. Those parts of our identities really drive who we are and what we do. It drives how we show up every day, who's in our life. So if we don't have this part, if we don't ask these questions, we're left with assumptions. We're, we can assume anything, all orientations. And really, assumptions are typically never great, and especially when doing investigative work, we're looking for facts. When we don't ask the questions, we're not giving the person the opportunity to share what they want about themselves. So if we ask about sexual orientation and gender identity, they can decline to share, but we are providing them the option with giving them the voice and the choice to do so. Also, in terms of relationships and interactions, we can continue to be calling somebody by the wrong name, the wrong pronoun. We might miss talking to them about some of their chosen family or continue talking about what we think are traditional support. So it's really important that these give us another element of who the person is in front of us. As far as interventions and how not asking these questions can impact our interventions, think of providing any service, whether you're a mental health provider, APS, anything that you're doing collaborative work with somebody. When we work with somebody, we typically know certain aspects of their lives, and then we tailor our care plan, our service plan, our referrals, and our collaborative goals to those aspects of their life. So if we don't know those aspects of their life, we're missing that opportunity. For APS specifically, this also can have a huge impact on medical self-neglect or self-neglect for medical reasons. For instance, there might be somebody who's referred for self-neglect not seeking their medical treatment, but there might be a reason why they're not seeking their medical treatment, especially for older adults or adults with disabilities who identify as LGBTQ+, have some fear of discrimination um, there's a few studies behind this as well, specifically one I'm thinking of is an NPR study, which shares people may not go to medical treatment if they fear discrimination. Also thinking within APS about service, in, service planning around placements, um, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, there might be a real fear of discrimination and their physical safety based on their identities. So we as APS or, or another provider might label them resistant or refusing services or non-compliant, but there might be a real reason why they're not going. And if we ask the questions and we could work with them to find an inclusive provider or an inclusive um, facility to work with. 
So feel free to type in the um, question box other things that might happen when we don't ask these questions. And we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So when we talk about workforce development support, Emily mentioned that the Academy for Professional Excellence's mission is to provide exceptional workforce development and learning experiences for the transformation of individuals, organizations, and communities. So over the years, we've had lots of discussions within our program at the Academy for Professional Excellence, as well as our stakeholders and our partners about how do we best support? I saw in the question box folks talking about, it's awkward. Is it going to detract from what we're there for? So those are that's what we're hearing and we wanted to be able to provide some workforce development support around it, specifically with investigators or providers that work with older adults or adults with disabilities that identify as LGBTQ+. When we were looking with some of our partners, we saw that the data uh, specifically around sexual orientation and gender identity, oftentimes had unknown or declined to answer. That may be true. It may be unknown, and they may have declined to answer. But what we were hearing is that some folks were just not asking for all sorts of reasons. They might have gone on their assumptions, or they might have gone on what the reporting party gave, and they didn't feel that they needed to follow up directly with the person. So for instance, adult child refers to APS that their mom is fill in the blank. APS goes to meet with mom, says, well, adult child was reporting party, says mom, so I don't need to ask about gender identity and I probably don't need to ask about sexual orientation. Then again, not giving mom the opportunity to share how they identify. We hear so much about, this is too personal. I'm not gonna ask an 80 year old a question about their sexual orientation or gender identity. And we wanted to build some support around that and be honest about it. But let's think about what APS does. Everything APS does is personal. They're in people's homes, oftentimes unannounced, looking in bank account records, talking to me about my drinking and eating habits, incontinence levels, all sorts of stuff. So while it may be personal to ask about somebody's sexual orientation and gender identity, it goes along with what APS does, asking these questions to find out who somebody is and what their experience is. We were also really wanting to touch base on the taboo issue. There's this feeling of, whoa, these are really taboo questions. That might be true for some, but I'd like to offer that for many folks of all ages and many folks of all ability levels are very comfortable talking about these aspects of our identities. For instance, myself as a gay woman, I welcome these conversations, not because of my generation, but because there are people in my life who won't talk about this with me. So if you're going to interview me and come into me, ask me all about this. I'd rather talk to you about this than what's in my savings account. So we really wanted to look at how do we support people being able to ask these questions and make it a part of their assessment. So I'm gonna pass it back to Emily and she's gonna go over just one support so far. Thank you, Kat. And next slide, please. So one of the workforce development tools that we designed to support APS professionals, like many of you on the call today, um, is a training video, which is about 10 minutes long and it's titled Asking Inclusive Demographic Questions. And it actually was released earlier this year. And we wanna share that it is something that's currently available. Anyone can access this video as it is posted right now on our website. Um, and we have two clips that we will be sharing in just a moment. But as a whole, this video is helpful in that it provides a few examples of how to share why the questions are being asked, explain how the data will be used, and provide an explanation of various terminology used in some of these demographic questions. So we're gonna look at a clip in just a moment and I wanna just frame it for, um, for us. So before demographic questions are asked, it's really helpful to first explain why they're being asked and how it may be of importance to you as an APS professional, as well as to the individual that you're talking with. So let's look at a clip from the Asking Inclusive Demographic Questions video. 
Um, and this clip demonstrates one way of explaining demographic questions before they are asked. Um, before we get too far along talking about your caregiver, I'd like to collect some demographic information about you. Um, it helps us identify the resources for our clients. Keep in mind, these are questions I ask everyone. The information is collected and analyzed and helps us identify the need for or measure the success of currently available and future resources. The numbers are then sent to the state and help to determine, you know, if there are some communities that may need services. I know that was probably a lot of information, but does that sound okay to you? I'm not sure how comfortable I am having the county break my life down into a bunch of, uh, what'd you call them? Demographics? I understand. Well, how about this? Your answers will help me to better perform my assessment and identify any resources I can offer to you. You know, if there's something you need now or in the future. And so you receive the best possible service available to you. All right. Okay. Ask your questions. All right. So that video clip really provides one example of how these conversations may be had. But we might be thinking, hmm, I really liked how that was said, or how might I share that differently? And that's totally okay. Um, and the beauty of a video clip is that there are various ways in which um, these video clips can be used with staff as a learning tool. So the video can be viewed individually or it can be viewed um, and discussed as a group, perhaps during a training or a unit meeting, or maybe it even lends itself to a conversation doing, during supervision, perhaps. All right, so now I was set to uh, share another clip, but Krista and Andy want to check in with you both. Um, is that something we'd want to do, can do, or should we move forward? Um, I think we can, I think if we just want to show the clip and then and then move forward after that, that would be great. How's okay, that sound? Sounds good. Let's go ahead and do that. So this All clip right. is about asking about one's sexual orientation or identity. My next question is about your sexual orientation or sexual identity. So do you identify as straight, gay or lesbian, bisexual? Questioning, unknown, or other. Oh, eso se siente un poco personal. That, that seems a bit personal. Hmm? Oscar, you're right. This can feel like a personal question. So let me assure you, I'm not asking about any intimate behavior. Just a clarification on how you would describe your primary physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to other people. Honestly, your answers for me are more than just checking a box on this form. Your answers to all of these questions just help me to avoid making any assumptions and maybe give you an opportunity to share your relationships or people important to you, you know, to the extent that you feel comfortable doing that. Se lo agradezco. I appreciate that. Of course. All right, so that video was designed um, to align with questions and responses that are actually listed on California's APS reporting form, which is the SOC 242. So that's not to say that the questions and responses provided in the video are the only way response options should be provided. There very well may be other more appropriate terms to use, um, which my colleagues here today with me will also share. So Kat, I'll pass it to you. Next slide. Thank you. I'm seeing in some of the questions um, some stuff that's making me excited that you all are here today with us. And another workforce development support that we're developing right now is an e-learning that is specific to APS work. And so it's titled Including Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Questions in APS Practice. I'm very excited to say that SAGE, where Terry is from as well, provided some technical assistance. Um, we've learned quite a bit from working with SAGE as well, and we've incorporated some of their handouts, which Terry is going to mention in their presentation. Within the e-learning, um, it does look at um, and Andy, if you can go back one slide, the learners that take the e-learning will look at the what, when, why, and how 
with the overall goal to support APS professionals, including these questions in every assessment with every one. And I was seeing in the question box about, I'm not sure how this relates to APS work. Why would it be important? There's been some stories of how it's important and why it's important. The e-learning covers this. The what focuses a lot on terminology and some education piece around language and that it's evolving. The when covers certain milestones that are extremely profound in LGBTQIA history and that impact that it has on our lives. It may talk about why there's some mistrust of government officials, um, why people don't want to go somewhere and be closeted again after they're not closeted anymore. It talks about why, why asking these questions are imperative and really helps make that connection so that folks may feel more comfortable asking. And then how really looks at, you may not ask this right away. You may wait until they bring up something else and you incorporate these questions then. And then we give the learner time to kind of try this out. There is a fee for the e-learning if you are outside of California, it will be available um, the very beginning of July. So if you have training funds to spend, this would be a use for it. If you are inside of California, the California Department of Social Services provides funding for our APS professionals here. Next slide, Anthony. Also within the Academy for Professional Excellence, we do have a program called RISE, which is our Responsive Integrative Health Solutions. It's our program out of the Academy that works with behavioral health providers. And they've created this desk guide that is specific for working with older adults who identify. Um, it's on our website, on Academy's website. It's just four pages that touches on the unique needs, as well as steps that organization and individuals can take to be welcoming, inclusive and culturally responsive. So take that, you know, look at that. And I know that Terry is going to provide some additional things. So next slide, Andy. Emily and I just really want to share that we are super grateful to have this opportunity to be with you and discuss this topic today. We realize there's all levels of comfortability and understanding. We also realize that this conversation wouldn't be happening 5, 10, 15 years ago. So it's really huge that we're all together in this space today learning from each other. And we look forward to hearing what our next partners say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so nice to be here. Um, thanks to my uh, my friends and colleagues, Krista and and Kat and Emily and Andy. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, uh, bring you some messages from Sage. So my name is Terry Clark, and I use she/her pronouns. And uh, I'm going to be talking about my uh, Sage today and some of the work that we've done to support providers and uh, with asking SOGI, uh, SOGI questions, sexual orientation and gender identity questions. Next slide, please. So many of you may have heard of SAGE. Uh, I know it was mentioned uh, by Emily and Kat. So SAGE is the country's largest and oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender older adults. And they've recently expanded their acronym. Um, I do a lot of uh, training and education work. And a question that often comes up is, you know, do we use that word queer? How, you know, and if we do, how do we use that? Um, and what the generational differences are. And we know language is always evolving, but SAGE has recently um, embraced the Q and now um, using it, uh, using that acronym to talk about their work uh, with uh, LGBTQ older adults. And you can find out much more about the organization on our website, sageusa.org, but they operate a number of different um, uh, programs, uh, are based in New York City, and uh, there's a training and education component. There's an advocacy component. Uh, component. They do lots of partnership work. Um, for example, the, the effort that's happening today and some of the resources that have been developed, uh, SAGE is there as a technical assistant. So next slide, please. So in, in terms of some statistics around LGBT 
older adults, LGBTQ plus older adults and uh, their unique needs. So uh, what we know in, in research happens um, with different organizations and has happened over the decades. Um, and we know that about 34% of our LGBTQ older adults live alone um, and that 32% don't want to be alone, that they are often in situations where they want to um, have relationships, have family, have caregivers, but because of the unique challenges that they grew up um, in the, the history of discrimination and stigma, having lost their families of origin, and we know that in um, here in the United States that uh, oftentimes the role of caregiver of family supports falls to the biological family, right? And oftentimes that biological family is not intact, um, that they rely, our LGBTQ older adults rely on families of choice or logical families, which is, you know, connected to why we need to ask these questions because sometimes family is not that biological family the way that many of us might think about that word, right? Um, we know about 40% of folks have shrinking support networks, right? So we know as people get older, they tend to become more vulnerable, tend to become more dependent on others. And if your, your support network, right, that cohort of people that you rely on for, um, activities of daily support around activities of daily living or you know just having a, a safe uh, environment if that support network shrinks then that older adult may become more vulnerable maybe more susceptible to um, neglect or to abuse and we've We've done some research too around older adults and their need for social connections. Many of them will seek um, dates online, will seek online friendship. And we know that in terms of the field of elder abuse and neglect, that oftentimes um, older adults will fall uh, sort of prey to online perpetrators and um, scamming. So uh, the, the idea that LGBTQ older adults reach out to that internet for social connection, um, for uh, supports can in some ways make them more vulnerable. Next slide, please. So when we talk specifically about elder abuse in the LGBT or LGBTQ community, right? Is it different, right? People say, well, what are some of the differences between um, heterosexual peers and LGBTQ older adults, right? So we know that there's a lot in common in terms of the factors that could make somebody more susceptible to uh, elder abuse. Um, and we know about our LGBTQ older adults that, uh, as I mentioned, are less likely to be in a sustained relationship, right? Um, that they're less likely to have ext those extended family relationships that come from uh, intergenerational connections, right? Having your, uh, the biological family of uh, your younger generations of nieces and nephews or children or grandchildren, that oftentimes with our LGBTQ older adults, those families of choice they form are in the same generational cohort. So we don't, there's not a lot of intergenerational uh, relationships within the LGBTQ um, family systems, right? They're less likely to, likely to reach out for help and oftentimes are in more in need of that help. So what we know just from looking at those unique challenges, right, having lived through uh, a lifetime of stigma and discrimination, right, having, um, you know, uh, unequal treatment under laws and policies, not having that uh, biological family intact, right, can all lead to more susceptibility, right? And, you know, when I work, I do a lot of trainings with aging service providers, and I'm, I'm based in uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. We've done a lot of work with our Department of Aging, too. And people say, well, you know, um, you know we treat everybody the same, right? We don't really need this training. We don't need, you know, everybody. We just treat everybody the same, right? And when we do that, though, right, that's just the opposite of what we're talking about in terms of person-directed, person-centered care. Right? So we want to find out who that 
person is, who that authentic person is that we are serving, right? And, but our LGBTQ older adults, they look at our aging landscape and they say, you know, when I was growing up, right, I couldn't reach out for help. I couldn't contact my AAA or I couldn't contact my uh, protective services or my legal uh, legal services or my healthcare provider because I would fear discrimination, right? So their perception is that our services are not going to be inclusive and welcoming. And we need to make that effort to create inclusive, welcoming services. And part of that is asking SOGI questions, right? More likely to have history of trauma. Next slide, please. Right, so, right, what did I just say, right? We don't discriminate, so why should we ask these questions? Why is this relevant to our work, right? Some of you are asking those questions, and here we are with my colleagues, we're, we're saying, yes, we wanna ask SOGI questions, right? It sends a welcoming message. This is the work that happened through that video, the training video, uh, the work that Kat and Emily are doing, um, right? Helps you learn about your client and build trust, Right? What is the, the core element of helping relationships is building trust, right? And it happens through conversation and communication and interviewing, right? Um, we want to really help promote the authenticity of our clients, right? Each client is different. Each client wants to be their authentic self and collects vital information that we need to know. And we're going to talk about the importance of data. I know um, Emily is going to be doing some of that. Next slide, please. Okay, so you may be wondering, right, how do I talk about sexuality and gender? How do I ask and explain these questions, right? Will these questions embarrass or offend anyone, right? It's okay to have concerns and questions. This is one form to get those answered, right? And when you go back to your, uh, your agencies, to your, your service provision, the supports are there in place, right? Um, Asking these questions is a skill you already have. You're doing interviewing, you're doing case investigations, right? You're talking to clients and you've got those skills, right? This is just one more um, nuance that's being added to that, right? We have many, many resources to support this. Next slide, please. So one example, right? So in that the training video, they're using one example of questions that people may ask, right, around gender identity and sexual orientation, right? So this set of questions, what is your gender? Maybe the options may be male, female, transgender, female to male, transgender, male to female, gender queer, gender non-binary, right? Not listed, please specify or decline not stated. Right. One example, remember I said uh, language is always evolving. So looking at that use of gender queer, gender non-binary. Right. What was your sex at birth? Right, Male, female, declined, not stated. And we know that recognizing when we're working with older adults and we're asking what was your sex at birth or sex assigned at birth, that oftentimes in those generations, people were not given the option to um, put different markers on their birth certificates. It was very much binary male or female. So when we're working with older adults, um, it's not unusual that that term intersex would not be included on the questions. Next slide, please. And here's an example of how to ask about sexual orientation, right? How do you describe your sexual orientation or sexual identity? Straight, heterosexual, bisexual, gay, lesbian, same gender loving. We know um, that oftentimes terms that are used that are uh, regional or cultural. And same gender loving is a term I know in my experience that um, uh, many uh, African-American communities will use that term to describe their same sex relationships. Questioning or unsure, not listed, please specify, give people the option, um, declined and not stated. The other word that you may hear or use is the word homosexual. So we know, again, generationally, that is a word that uh, many older adults still use, although in our best practices, it's not a, a, not a word that um, is recommended. Next slide, please. 
and here just sort of in our summary, right, that oftentimes we make those assumptions, right, that people are, are straight um, until proven LGBT or LGBTQ, right? So again, keeping our assumptions in check and make it even more important to ask these questions. And next slide. So summary of the best practices, right? We wanna have a clearly stated confidentiality policy written on all forms and ask staff to read the policy out loud before beginning the intake process, right? Explaining to the client that this is confidential. Explain how a client's personal information, such as name, gender identity, sexual orientation, health conditions, and other information may or may not be used by the agency talked about that, and emphasize that your agency will not discuss a client's sexual orientation or gender identity without their family um, or friends without the client's specific permission, right? So they need the client's permission. And if a client wishes to have certain areas of the intake form left blank, such as sexual orientation or gender identity, do not force them to give an answer. Next slide. So additional resources, uh, the LGBT Center uh, has developed an inclusive questions for older adults guide that's free, downloadable from uh, the LGBT Aging Center. And then Sage Care um, offers a whole suite of trainings around serving LGBTQ older adults, including asking uh, SOGI questions. Next slide. Uh, one final resource, uh, this, uh, you can download this from the LGBT Aging Center uh, and really uh, is um, highlighting the National uh, LGBT Elder Day. It's a resource guide that is um, on uh, elder abuse uh, within the LGBTQ community. And that is my last slide. Thank you. Oh, we're gonna ask the questions, right? So question box, question time, folks. Have you started collecting sexual orientation, gender identity data or SOGI data? If you could put that into the question box, we will review that. Um, and then what are your experience, experiences with this, right? So we can you know, hear from folks that um, sometimes there's some great successes, right? We'd like to hear the success stories along with the challenging times. So thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's been such a pleasure to hear from um, Emily and Kat and Terry. My name is Elizabeth Petrui. I'm an aging services program specialist with the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services at the Administration for Community Living. Um, I'm going to move kind of quick because I want to save time for questions and I have a lot of slides, but a lot of the information has been covered by the previous speakers. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, so what is ACL? If you're not familiar, the Administration for Community Living was established in 2012. It's part of the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, and it brought together some existing offices within HHS, the Administration on Aging, the Office on Disabilities, and the Administration on Developmental Disabilities. Um, we've since then uh, sort of expanded, and we have additional divisions and offices that are part of ACL now. But our collective focus is on community living to ensure that older adults and people with disabilities have the right to live where and with whom they choose and fully participate in their communities. Next slide. And this is a little sort of funneling down. You can see my office, Elder Justice and APS, as well as the Office of Long-Term Care Ombudsman Programs as part of the Administration on Aging, AOA, within ACL, within HHS. So we're you know, the center of the nesting doll. Next slide. Um, our vision for elder justice builds on that mention, that mission that I mentioned earlier. We see a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach that effectively supports older adults and adults with disabilities so they can exercise their right to live where they choose, with the people they choose, and fully participate in their communities without threat of abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. Next. And I know I'm flying through these, but you will have the slides available for you after the fact, and it's being recorded. So if you want to slow down and read all of these offices, um, or rather programs, this is our elder justice and rights portfolio. So you can see um, we cover legal services, income security, long-term care ombudsman programs, elder abuse prevention, 
um, and adult protective services. Next slide. All right. So we're talking about asking demographic data questions, uh, but who cares? Why are we talking about data? Next slide. Now, and I apologize because my eye is watering. Um, our underlying assumption is that you care because data empower you to improve the lives of the people we serve. Uh, if you don't agree with me on this, then there's not uh, much point in paying attention to all of these resources, because ultimately we believe this is the fundamental reason to ask these questions. We can use the data we have to improve people's lives. Next slide. Data allow us to identify what matters, to focus on performance and results, and determine and justify the need for appropriate services to achieve those results. And they help us know who is successful, what works, where we are successful, when we are successful. Um, I think you saw the example in the video that Kat and Emily shared that the worker explained that the reason they were collecting that data was to ensure that they had appropriate services available for the population within the county. This is how we know um, that we have what is, what is gonna work. Next slide. So data can be used um, in a three-step process. There, it starts with accountability. And when you hold yourself accountable, you can improve practice by measuring performance. When you measure performance, focus on program improvement, you can improve your program overall. And we'll touch on each of these as we move forward. Um, next slide. We use data to improve accountability. Uh, so when we think about using data to improve accountability, there are two things we can measure. We can measure casework practice and we can measure staff performance. Next slide. Um, when we are using data to improve practice, we both report to external and internal stakeholders. And I think it's critical to keep in mind, going back to that point of how do we know we have the appropriate resources, that what gets measured gets moved, gets done, managed, changed, rewarded, improved. It makes a difference. So what gets measured is what matters ultimately. Next slide. All right. Um, when we are using data to improve program performance, there are some different areas to think about here. We want to review program performance holistically and systemically across the organization using tools. So as you're looking at your data collection, and here we're talking specifically about demographic data, if you find that like only 20% of cases actually record the client's uh, demographic data, that tells you something about whether or not staff are actually asking the question or if they're defaulting to, um, I assumed I knew what was correct or I just didn't wanna ask because I felt uncomfortable. So that can tell you something about where training might be needed for staff. At that point, you can measure the effectiveness of policy and practice changes, use data as part of an ongoing quality assurance process, measure compliance and assess what makes a difference. So. Unfortunately, this isn't a one and done. You're gonna to wanna to take a look at what data is being collected now, how it's being used, and then continuously go back, see if changes impact how things are being collected, um, and see if you need to make more tweaks or have additional training. Next slide. Now, when you manage with data, it's a means, not an ends, to improving outcomes for clients. Data can help you ask the right questions, but rarely provides definitive answers on how to improve performance. And the rewards are worth the effort, but there may be potential unintended consequences. And so, and we got a little bit with that, with what I've seen in the questions about people feel uncomfortable, they're unsure about how to ask these questions. I hope that the previous presenters have addressed some of those concerns, but this is something that takes practice. Um, and also to get that positive feedback of once they actually are engaging with clients in this way to see that it, it rather than hampering or hindering rapport, it may be helpful in building it. Next slide. 
I want to talk a little bit about the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. So if we go back in time to 2013, we had no national data um, collection around adult maltreatment or um, as investigated by APS. So we had no national estimates for the extent or magnitude of elder abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation and exploitation of adults with disabilities. No reliable information about risk factors, protective factors, or perpetrator characteristics. And this was a unanimously identified need. People were clamoring from the National Academies of Science. Congress and the Elder Justice Act stated this, the Government Accounting Office, Government Accountability Office, actually, I apologize, it's a typo on this slide. And the EJCC, the Elder Justice Coordinating Council, all said, we need better data. So, next slide. Um, we wanted to understand not only those factors about clients, but also knowing how it's collected via APS, there are some challenges. So there's wide variability across and within state and local APS programs. We have that history of no performance data, inconsistent state data, no prior comprehensive evaluation on a national scale about state systems, a lack of theoretical frameworks for analyzing APS, and efficacy and outcomes are difficult to define and measure. So we were kind of in the wild west. Next slide. NAMERS was created to collect consistent, accurate national data on the exploitation and abuse of older adults and adults with disabilities as reported to state APS agencies. So you can see in that mission kind of where the name comes from. Next slide. Data unlocks many doors. It gives us a broader understanding of what APS does. It allows us to um, advocate for resources and improvements. It allows us to target research and evaluation and to develop best practices and service innovation. And so next slide, when we think about the data attributes of what make up namers, we have client data, um, we have victim data. So this is separated out in terms of once um, there's a substantiation, someone might be considered a victim. And I know that that language is not used by everyone, but that is the language that's used in namers. Um, we have information on perpetrators and we have agency info. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit, there was a question in the questions box about client racial data and what um, sort of the, not being able to categorize people as biracial or, sort of confusion about categorizing people as biracial because it's sort of a miscellaneous. And I did wanna to speak to just sort of how namers actually breaks this down. So with namers, we do have to align with the census and with other national data systems for interoperability purposes. Uh, but within namers, you actually can select multiple races and there's, um, you, we'll include the link to this, but you can see, you can select American Indian or Alaskan Native, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, Guamanian, um, white or other, and you can select multiple. There's also subcategories for each of those. So um, while it can be tough, I know the census is sort of has um, a little bit more specific categories, um, I do understand that not everybody disaggregates in the same way and that can be confusing. Next slide. All right, how does NAMERS benefit states? So it does provide a framework of what data is important to APS programs and when you can look at the data to actually self-examine and improve program insights it also allows states to refine and enhance data collection systems. So as that, as the national system was created, it provided impetus to actually have better data collection at the state level and to advocate for, you know, more um, technologically advanced case management systems. And next year, data will, it says probably here, we'll keep our fingers crossed, likely be available for cross-state comparisons to identify opportunities for program improvement. Right now, when you look at a NAMERS report, um, even in tables where it's broken out by state, they're de-identified, so you can't tell which state is which, but we are in the process of updating NAMERS, and that should be available soon. Next slide. 
So ultimately, how do we use namers to inform research? Um, we've conducted process and are in the process of conducting an outcome evaluations for APS clients focused on better understanding the APS system across states and how it impacts the services that clients receive. We have applied uh, predictive analytics approaches to understanding risk and protective factors at both the community and individual level for uh, involvement with APS. We use NAMERS data to provide ongoing technical assistance to APS programs and to justify spending to Congress. So just talk about what are APS programs doing? Who are they serving? Next slide. And if you're interested in our predictive analytics work, um, we did, we are using it to experiment with machine learning approaches to better understand the nature of risk among APS clients. Uh, we partnered with some data scientists through a contract to develop those machine learning tools. The APS TARC has provided research and support, and we convened a technical expert panel to provide insight and guidance. So that's an ongoing project and it's really exciting. Next slide. In terms of what is next for namers, uh, we are using the information from a recently completed gap analysis to improve the completeness of data. What we've heard from the folks who don't want to ask the questions, that means that we have um, blank or unknowns in a lot of fields. So we have 100% participation from states, but not 100% of the data elements. We are renewing and updating through OMB um, to improve the system and to make data more available for states and general research. Next slide. So these are some statistics from the National Center on Elder Abuse. Um, 80 million Americans will be age 65 or older in the next 18 years, nearly 21% of the population. One in 10 Americans, 60 and over, experience at least one form of elder abuse every year. 67% of older adults abused are women, and one in 24 cases are reported. We know it's a big problem, but you can see only one of those questions really gets at demographic data, and there's so much more for us to learn about risk and protective factors, who is at risk, and how to best respond, what are culturally appropriate and specific best practices. Next slide. To learn more, you can visit namers.acl.gov. We have five years of reports going back to 2016, and the 2021 report will be up soon. And I think I have taken all of our time for questions, but there are some additional resources for you. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you very much. So let's um, go ahead and next slide, Andy. Um, why we there is one question I do since um, if if our presenters can come back up on board. There are resources here. There's resources throughout the presentation. Please go ahead and download that handout. Um, I'm going to take a minute extra if folks don't mind. Please leave if you got to jump to a different meeting, but. There was a question um, that I want to hear from, especially our trainers. Do the panelists feel it's a good idea to ever revisit these questions later in an interview or even on a subsequent visit after a rapport has been better built? And there's a lot of um, some comments and questions around what if folks are just really not, um, the client is just not going to feel, not feeling comfortable answering these questions. So that's one I did want to address. I can share Krista and thank you for whoever posed that because I think that's part of the art of interviewing, right? Is when do we ask a lot of questions? We don't typically, you know, shake somebody's hand and say, okay, check, check, check. Tell me about this either. Um, so I think it's definitely going to depend. Rapport building is always good for any type of question. In the e-learning that I discussed, and I think also in the video, it shows different levels of when to ask, um, because somebody might be like me and share everything right up front, and you can ask me right up front, but somebody may not be like me, and it might be better to wait after that rapport has built for sure, and if you get a subsequent visit, because you may not get that either. So it's really about balance and kind of knowing um, the situation and trying your best. Terry, anything to add? Uh, no, just that, you know, it, you know, validate yourself in your skills as an interviewer and gathering information. And it's perfectly all right, the, you know, the next time that you are with that client um, to bring it up again um, and just, you know, sort of leave the door open 
right? So let them know. I understand it may not be a good time to an ask this, answer the question, but please know if you want to ever come back to it to talk about it or to answer it. I'm, you know, we can certainly do that. Great, thank you. All right, well, I want to say, gosh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank our presenters. Thank you, Kat and Terry and Emily and Elizabeth. This has been great. I assure you this is just one step in the journey that the field is taking. Um, this isn't the, the end all, so we will return and have more conversations around this topic. Um, I want to thank you all. The, amazing amount of information and sharing and your honesty and your questions and I, think, I actually think we got to most questions but your your sharing is just amazing so thank you for for being being there for that um, and thank you for attending thank you Andy for running slides and we hope to see you um, for our next APS webinar for the greater field on July 14th um, innovative responses to self-neglect again nobody you, know, you don't have to worry about stuff in the gut, right? Yeah, no. So in, anyway, go ahead and, and join join us here on July 14th. A registration is open. Emails have been going out. But if you haven't seen those, please just contact us. And you will see all the contact information um, here on our slide, all the different ways to follow us. And thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of your week and great day. And thanks, presenters. It was good to see you all. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.